Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Right to Read initiative. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and I have the pleasure of having Maureen Steltman join me today to discuss her journey. Now, Maureen has recently retired from Fraser Academy. So thank you for joining me today, Maureen. Can you give us a little bit of a idea about what you were doing at Fraser Academy when you retired? Sure. Um, so I was the head of school at Fraser for the last 14 years. Uh, my involvement with the school stretched about 25 years, first as a parent and then, um, you know, as a volunteer and then as an employee. So I'm kind of one of those people that, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> In true dyslexic fashion, I, I kind of end up being in charge of whatever I do, mostly because I'm not a good follower. <laughs> and dyslexics have an amazing ability to lead. And, uh, you know, um, so some might say it was quite surprising that I ended up uh, leading Fraser Academy when I wasn't actually a teacher by, by uh, training. But... Um, you know, I'm a firm believer that uh, you don't need to know every skill in the toolbox to be the best leader. So anyway, that's how I ended up there was through through my own kids attending the school. And and um, uh, it's been my great privilege to serve there. And I love that population. The kids there are so bright and funny and charming and interesting. And boy, do they come up with some great ideas and ways to solve problems. So it really has been a, a real pleasure to uh, get to be involved in the school over time. Of course, and you, you've done wonderful things with the school. But you mentioned that you're dyslexic. So let's go back a few years what was school yes. like for you well if you'd ever asked me if I would end up running a school I would have said with some expletives I might add are you kidding <laughs> <laughs> because I hated school I absolutely hated my school career up till the age of 18 all I couldn't I could not wait to get out of school and I ended up taking extra courses to graduate early because I had such um, derision for for the uh, experience and for the, I, I hate to say this, but really I had a lot of disrespect for the teachers as well in my um, own high school career. So same with elementary school too. Uh, you know, I didn't realize that I was dyslexic until my children um, were diagnosed. And um, as you do as a parent, you are often reflecting on your own um, life as you watch your children grow up. And, and um, it was actually at Fraser Academy that I learned um, that I uh, might be dyslexic. And um, both my kids were in the school and there was a speaker uh, parent education night. And the speaker was talking about um, the fact that the kids at Fraser were lucky because they were struggling as children. And if uh, for dyslexic struggling in, as a child is not such a bad thing because you um, learn to tackle adversity and ha learn how to handle it and not quit on yourself. And he said, when, and it was almost a throwaway comment. He said, you know, dyslexia is really bad for the kids who are bright and good talkers because it's most difficult for them because they get through school because they're good talkers, not because they actually have the skills that you need to get through skills through school. And um, he said, often those kids will go on to university and they get to university. They can no longer avoid the reading. They can no longer avoid the workload, but they don't have the skills to actually complete the work that's assigned to them. And he said, those kids often drop out in first year and they never go back. And I had to leave the room because I was so upset. I thought this guy's talking about my life. And I literally had to leave the room because I didn't want to cry in front of the other parents that were there. And um, I got home and I was very upset. And I said to my husband, you know, I think I might be dyslexic. And he started laughing. And in a kind way, he was laughing in a kind way. But he said to me, you know, 
Maureen, you don't know your right from left. You can't spell to save your life. And you'll never go to a subtitled movie with me. Of course, you're dyslexic. And I, I, when he said it that way, I kind of started laughing too, through the tears. I was laughing, he was laughing, and he's like, it's fine, you know, don't, you know, it, there's no need to be upset. You're fine. You're still you. But I, um, he, you know, that was a, a, a really surprising thing, even though I had been looking at my kids, really, we were not... I guess my husband just assumed that I knew, but I didn't know. And um, I, so I, I emailed um, the, the presenter and said, you know, do you think there's any value in getting tested as an adult? And he replied with just the most amazing, compassionate response right away as well, which was so lovely because I was in distress about it. He said, you know, um, in his experience, getting tested as an adult can be one of the most healing and uplifting experiences. And um, he even offered to do it for me for half price because he had done both my kids. <laughs> A site, but but he had completed both my kids' psych eds. And um, so I decided to go ahead and do it. And um it was quite confronting to do it too, because you know, by then this time I was 39 or 40. So it was it was quite confronting uh to go and do the testing and and um I I had a friend who uh have a friend who's a psychologist at UBC and and she had diarized the day I was getting my results and she phoned me when I got the results and I, I, you get the results and you don't really know what to do with them. Right. It's like, okay, what does all this mean? And um, she said to me, you know, I, I know you got your results. How, well, uh, you know, what did you find out? And I said, well, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, and she said, well, why, what could you have learned that is, that bad and I said well it wasn't that bad it was that good and um she said so you found out you're smart and I said yeah and I'm not really sure what to do with that and she was brilliant actually she put it in really good context for me she said okay so I'm one of your best friends I go yep you are and who's your other friend your your other friend other good friend I say well my friend Lynn and she goes so Lynn's a director at the law society I'm one of the top of my field in the world I just want to ask you this we're your two best friends do you think we'd hang around with someone who is stupid and it was such a good um context for me to actually understand a little more of who I was because I'd spent the first half of my life thinking that I really just wasn't that smart. And in fact, when I told my parents that I was dyslexic, they also said, well, that can't be. We just, your teachers always told us you just weren't that smart. <laughs> and, you know, um, what I found out of my psych ed is that my IQ is 126. And that's, taking into consideration the gaps that I have in the school academic arena. So um, you couldn't, I couldn't say that about myself anymore. And one of the things that um, through this process is, you know, what does all this mean to me now that I know, but some really, really great things happened for me as a result of knowing so one of the things my husband predicted was that, you know, I think it's going to take you about three years to figure out what this means to you and how it's going to change your life and what you're going to do with it. And, you know, he encouraged me to just take some time and sort of sit with it and, you know, figure it all out. What does it mean to me? And um, one thing that started happening almost right away is I have different ideas than a lot of people. And of course, when you have different ideas, people question them. And if you don't think you're that smart, you don't necessarily trust your own judgment. So one of the things that started happening pretty quickly is when people would challenge me on an idea that I had, I would say, yeah, that's what I think instead of mm, maybe you're right. Maybe I am wrong. Mm, I'm not really sure. 
what the psych ed did for me is give me the confidence that actually I'm good with my answer and whether or not you agree with me is okay, but uh, it's, it's my answer. So I got a totally different level of confidence within myself as a result of that. So, um, you know, as a kid, I used to get into trouble because I used to think of obvious answers to things. And I wasn't very good at, as a child, at um, hiding. If you thought that my idea was stupid, I wasn't very good at hiding my disdain about that. (laughs) And of course, as you get older, you start to learn, uh, you learn better and better how to be more kind, more accepting of other people's ideas, but also how to hold your ground. And, um, you know, while I had been a leader all my life, I had always second guessed myself. And I also had not always been um, as accepting and um respectful of other people's ideas as I could be. And finding out about my dyslexia actually helped me understand that I think differently than other people and that that's actually a strength, not something to feel bad about. And um, being able to accept that difference really um, helped me a lot. And um, sorry, there's someone talking in the background. They're just leaving, I think. (laughs) Anyway, um, the um, the thing about trusting my own decisions, um, it just made me feel a lot better about myself. And it was like someone gave me permission to trust myself in a way that I hadn't trusted myself previously. And um, one of the things that my husband commented on, again, he's, you might think he's quite involved in the story, but he actually is because he was really helpful in um, my gaining insight into myself. One of the things he mentioned to me was how often I said during the course of a day, oh, I'm so stupid. And I didn't think, like he said to me, do you have any idea how often you say that? I say, I don't say that. He's like, uh, yeah, yeah, do. <laughs> So I started paying attention. And the first day that I decided to pay attention to that, I caught myself seven times saying, I'm so stupid. And, you know, when you think a little differently, when teachers don't respect you as a child, it's really easy to think, to start thinking that you're stupid. And that diagnosis of dys- dyslexia genuinely allowed me to recognize, I think differently, that's okay. And I don't need your approval. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. And that made a huge, huge difference in my everyday well being. Mm-hmm. And I told, um, obviously, a few people about this uh, diagnosis and, and uh, you know, I'm, that I'm figuring out what it means to me. And I went to lunch with the board chair of Fraser Academy. Um, uh, her name is Brenda Kinsella. And she, uh, at that time, was not yet the board chair at Fraser, but he, she was a parent at the school. And um, I was working as a school's fundraiser and um, she was chairing an event. So we went to have a meeting about the event. And in the meeting, we were talking personally as well. And I said that I was thinking about going back to school. And um, she was so great because she said, that's a really good idea. She never, you know, I was probably 42 then. And, and she, she said, what schools might you go to? What are you thinking of? And I had always known since I was a teenager that there were some business schools that would allow you to do an MBA without an undergraduate degree. And um, I talked to her about that and she really encouraged me and said, let's meet for lunch next week. And when we, when we meet, you can tell me the research that you've done about the schools. And that was really helpful to me because someone I admired and respected basically said, yeah, you could do that. And I think it's a great idea. I think you should. And um, I ended up uh, looking at, there's two schools in BC. You can do that. One is SFU and one is Royal Roads. Um, I ended up choosing Royal Roads because I could, it worked best with my um, uh 
my work schedule. So by this time, I have two teenagers. I'm working full time, and now I'm doing a full time MBA program. And, and you know, if you had told me that in my teen years that I would tackle something like that, I never would have believed it because I always saw myself as not somebody who was that smart. I always knew I was capable, but I never knew that I was smart. And those things are very different. And recognizing and learning that I was a, uh, an intellectually intellectually a, a person who can carry their own weight made just such a difference. So here I am in, in uh, you know, doing the MBA and, and, you know, I used to go to bed at nine, get up at four in the morning, work before I went to, you know, got my kids up and got them to school and then come home and I'd work in the evening. And, you know, really my husband gave up about two years of Saturday nights because I was on a Saturday night, I would be working, (laughs) but it was such an important thing for me to do because I really did by then have something to prove. Mm-hmm. And I had to to apply as a mature student without an undergrad degree at either university. You have to write a letter and you have to provide references and uh, and all of that. But in my letter, I wrote about discovering that I was dyslexic, that I was dyslexic and that I um, was entitled to some accommodations and that all these, uh, um, you know, that that everything that had happened in my life, I really felt had led up to me writing this misunderstanding about myself. And um, it was, it, it was a really cathartic letter to write and I got accepted. And, um, you know, be- between getting accepted and starting the program, one of the things I did do is I went um, and worked with a woman named Daphne Beams. I don't know if any of you know her, but she is someone who's had a long history of working with people with dyslexia. And she um, she was terrific. She helped me with study skills. Um, you know, we strategized how do you get the content when you don't remember what you're reading out of a book? How do you actually gl- glean the content? And um, so I actually did my MBA without ever reading a full textbook because I couldn't, I just couldn't, I'd, I'd be reading away and, you know, my mind would be in 10 different places and I'd at, finish the page and I go, well, I don't know what the heck that said. <laughs> I have no idea what was on that page, <laughs> but I have 10 other things in my head. Yeah. And um, so one of the strategies, for example, was to read the opening paragraph of a, of a chapter in a book, read the closing paragraph of the chapter in the book, and then read back from the closing chapter, chapter or paragraph by paragraph until you feel like you have an understanding of what they were saying in the beginning and the end. And the other really great advice that that worked really, really well for me. And um, the other piece of advice that ties into this is the the advice that I got from my friend at UBC, uh, uh, Catherine Rankin. Catherine said, um, you know, you're in a master's program. You have nothing to prove. So don't go for 100 percent. Pick the percentage that you will be happy with and can live around plus or minus five, because you will kill yourself trying to get to a hundred percent. And so pick, pick what you're going to do, what, what your goal is, pick what your goal is, and then just work to that. And on every assignment, you look to have I reached my goal. So my goal, the pass rate in an MBA is 70%. So my goal was 80 plus or minus five, Mm -hmm. because Kathy's point was really good, a really good one, right? It's you don't have to be the best in your class. What you have to do is tackle the content and demonstrate your knowledge of it, but you don't have to be the best. You're already in the best. You're in the top 20% of the population already. You already know that. So you got nothing to prove here. Just Mm -hmm. pick your mark and go for that. So when there was a question that we needed to answering, it would always be, have I reached 80% yet? And if the answer was yet, the books were closed on to the next. And that was really, really helpful. In the 80%, how that worked for me was 
there was, I think once that I got a 78 and everything else was over 80. So that was a really helpful study tip and a study tool for me. And then there was one other thing um, that uh, was really helpful, which was putting um, all the stickers up on the, um, hold on, I'll try and move. Sorry. Oh, no problem. Okay. So then so, um, sorry, just moving through the house. <laughs> um, the other thing that was really helpful to me was putting stickers up on the wall of all the assignments. So I would make myself a sticker calendar of everything that was due in the term. Mm -hmm. And every time an assignment was completed, I would take great relish in ripping that sticky off the wall. And it gave the, gave me a sense of momentum. And you think these things don't really matter. Like it's just a sticky on the wall, who cares, but they actually really help in terms of building momentum, building a sense that you are completing things, moving forward, accomplishing your goal. And honestly, my MBA came down to a whole series of stickers on the wall in, in uh, my kitchen or my dorm room, depending where I was. <laughs> and um, those kinds of things really, really helped. Okay. And, and um, I, I will say, I think as a dyslexic student, you get a lot more tired yeah. because you're working so much harder than a mainstream student. And um, those things, you know, as, as I, I think that's important to manage your expectations and not to feel bad that you've gotten tired and those kinds of things. Um, you know, by the end, I was so, so glad to be finished, but it was such an important thing for me to do. It was, honestly, it was, it really was a life-changing thing and it certainly changed the course of my life. Of course. Let's take a moment and rewind a little bit. So sure. you didn't find out about your dyslexia until after your children were diagnosed. Yes. So what was it like in those first few years of school for your children before they were diagnosed for dyslexia? How was that for you emotionally seeing your children struggle? Oh, it's dre dreadful. It's absolutely devastating to watch your kids struggle and that, you know, they don't want to be at school, you know, please don't make me go. They're crying, begging you not to, <laughs> please don't make me go to school. One day I got out of my car and my son was in the car still. So I had driven him down to school. My son was in the car. I was out of the car and he locks all the doors. So I'm outside the car and all the doors are locked and he's inside the car and he's crying and saying, I don't want to go to school. Don't make me go to school. And I'm on the outside of the car crying. <laughs> and All the other parents are walking by with their perfectly little behaved children running, walking by, seeing me crying, seeing Mark crying. It was awful. Absolutely awful. And, um, you know, it's, it's a real hornet's nest in a mainstream classroom for a child with dyslexia because of the whole reading movement that has infiltrated education in BC. And also because of the fact that our teachers are really not adequately trained in the science of reading. Mm -hmm. And when you find out that your child, you know, cannot read in the classroom, it's, it's extremely upsetting and it's shocking how many people look to you as the parent and going, well, it's, it must be because you're a bad parent because it's certainly not the teacher's fault. And, um, you know, those kinds of things are really uh, prevalent even today where parents are blamed for their child's lack of school performance and the lack of knowledge and understanding in the education system about dyslexia and about reading in general is hugely disheartening. That's one of the reasons Fraser Academy has started a teacher training center using science-based 
proven methodology of teaching kids to read mm-hmm. because you know they say the incidence of dyslexia or a learning difference that affects reading is one in five if we had proper instruction we could probably reduce that number to one in 10 or even one in 12 and um you know so many kids are struggling with reading as reading as a result of poor instruction and that was the case in my children's public school without question is that you know um well we're teaching it's not our fault that they're not learning and you know there's there is a huge disconnect between any teacher that says i'm teaching and the child, i can't help it if the child's not learning of course That's your job as a teacher is to ensure that the child is learning and to meet that child where they're at, especially young children in elementary school and primary school. Mm -hmm. Those kids need to be met where they're at and then brought forward incrementally and sequentially. And teachers don't do that. It's too much work. Mm -hmm. And they don't even even I, I shouldn't characterize teachers that way, because certainly there are many, many brilliant teachers out there but there are also teachers that do take that attitude and more than I would like to count and you know I think the whole education system needs to improve its accountability and that's one of the things that um, you know I used to say at Fraser when parents would say well what does my tuition because Fraser Academy is nonprofit, but it is tuition charging and Um, people would say, well, what does my tuition buy me? And I say, accountability results. And there's almost no schools that will say that to you. And yet that as parents, especially as parents of kids with learning difficulties, that's what we need is accountable teaching staff, accountable administrators in schools. And we just don't have that the way we need it. Mm -hmm. And we don't teach our teachers in teacher training colleges that way. You know, there's a lot more talk about the rights of teachers rather than, um, you know, the rights of students and families. And um, it's discouraging. One uh, one of our staff members at Fraser went to um, a class on learning disabilities at UBC, and she asked four of us to come in from Fraser uh, as a panel. And so we brought a grade 12 student, a UBC student who was an alum, me, and another staff member who was dyslexic. And all they wanted to talk about in the class was why weren't we at Fraser Academy fighting for um, public school education? And I, I finally, I said, you know, you have to understand the parents at Fraser Academy are exhausted from fighting the public school battle. And that is why they come to Fraser is because they don't have time in their child's life to wait for the school to get it right. Their child keeps getting older every year. And if without the right kind of education, when they need it, those kids' future is jeopardized. Definitely. And so, you know, when, when people at um, in the edu- in the education department wanted to question on that us on that we we're saying but you know you're talking to parents whose child's life is in the balance we don't have time to make this fight with you we're fighting over here to get our kids properly educated yeah so when did the term dyslexia first enter your life um I think the term dyslexia first entered my life. I had a friend who finished high school when I finished high school who was dyslexic. And I didn't really understand what that meant at the time. I knew that he had a great deal of difficulty reading, but I didn't really know what that meant. And, um, you know, in hindsight, I wish that I had known more because, um, Uh, I graduated high school at the at the end of grade seven, uh, 1979. And so at that time, there really, you know, Fraser Academy wasn't open yet. Any any of the schools for LD kids, there were very few of them. And there was very little that a parent could do. There were very little resources. And um, to have 
um, my friend who, who, um, well, here's, here's what I want to say to parents on reflection about this is because I didn't realize I was dyslexic. My friend did know he was dyslexic. In my family, it was do or die. You will learn, you will do your schoolwork. You work really, really hard in our family. That was the way it was growing up. And my mother taught English at UBC. The thought that her child would not learn to read was not even a question in our house. And um, in my friend's house, you know, there was a lot of empathy for him, which of course is important, but that you can't let a dyslexic child off the mat. Mm -hmm. They have to do their work just like everybody else. And when we feel sorry for a kid who has dyslexia, we do them a huge disservice. You know, oh, I feel so bad. I, I actually had someone say that about my son and it made me very angry. I feel so bad for your son because, you know, he struggles so much with reading and ADD and, you know, life is hard for him and I feel bad for him. And I'm thinking, this is not what he needs. What he needs is someone to say, buck up, baby. Yeah, it's a heck of a ride. Get on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know that my friend had a lot more empathy and a lot more people feeling bad for him than ever felt for me. Right. But I think I ended up in a better position because I was expected to perform no matter what. And I think as parents of dyslexic kids, if I had a do over, I would do less for my kids, not more. My kids are now in their 30s and both doing really well, but they had a hard time transitioning out of high school into adult life. And I think part of the reason for that is because we felt bad about their their difficulties. And I think that's, as parents, in hindsight, one of the worst things you can do. It's funny, you know, I was criticizing teachers earlier. And on the other hand, I would tell you that I have, since I became the head of Fraser Academy, my respect has grown tremendously for teachers. And um, meeting some of the people in the Independent Schools Association, there are some very dedicated and committed people. And I have learned so much from those good teachers at Fraser Academy who do have that training that our kids need. And um, one of the things I, I learned was do, do less, not more for your child. Hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't do that in our culture, not just for dyslexic kids, but for many, many kids do not. They have this sense that they're entitled without actually performing, without actually proving their own worth in the process. And I think that's a very important step we're missing in raising our children now. You know, if your child... There was a family at, at Fraser whose um, child crashed the family car. You know, he was 17 and he'd just gotten his license and he, he crashed the car. And his dad said, well, good thing you have a job because you'll be paying that deductible. And I know that in our house, we would not have asked our child to pay that deductible. And yet that boy, you know, he did super well going out of high school and into university because his parents held him accountable. Yeah. And I think it's a real risk when you have a child with a learning difference to feel bad and, oh, well, we won't make you work as hard. And, oh, gosh, you're tired. You can take a break. And taking a break is absolutely important. It is. But always to go back and finish the work. Of course. One of the tips that um, we talk about at Fraser when kids, um, you know, a, a good survival te technique for kids is to say, I don't know, especially if they have a working memory, slower working memory as well. They have they learn pretty quickly that I can get people off my back or people will do my work for me if I say I don't know. And mm -hmm. as parents, I think one of the most important things we can do is say to our kids, well, I'll give you some time to think about it. And we'll talk about it again at dinner, after dinner, tomorrow, whenever it is. But to not let I don't know stand is a very, very important thing. Because if you just give the answer, you've told your child two things. One, I don't think you're capable. Mm -hmm. And two, you can manipulate me with, I don't know. So 
you don't ever want to let that I don't know stand. It, it's not that you're going to force them to give an answer right in that moment, but you give them that cue that says, okay, I'll give you some time to think about it. And we're going to come back to it at this time or that time, whatever time works for your family. Of course. But it, it's, it's a very, very important tool because of the learned helplessness that is associated with learning differences and dyslexia. Of course. So oh, oh, what age did your children get the diagnosis of dyslexia? Um, Lauren was in between grade one and grade two. We got her a psych ed, private psych ed. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, as this, these things go, actually, no, sorry. She was between grade two and three. We did it in between grade two and three. Our son was between grade one and two. Um, so we went into the school in grade three. Um, the the local public school in grade three, and I'm there with my psych ed, and I was the chair of the pack. So of course I get the first meeting and um, they say to me, well, we're not going to, um, we don't necessarily recognize this psych ed and we're not going to give her a cue because, you know, that's only going to make her life harder and, you know, all this nonsense. But of course you don't know what you don't know as a parent and you believe And I believe many of the people watching this will also believe that the teacher knows what they're doing. And that's not necessarily true. Or the administrator knows what they're doing. It's not necessarily true. If you think about why they didn't want to give my child a cue, if you know anything about the public school system, and probably parents on this call do, but if you know anything about it, you know that there was a restriction of the number of kids with a cue you could put in a classroom. So it would make their class scheduling much more difficult if my child had a cue. That's what that was about. It had nothing to do with what she needed as a student. Yeah, unfortunately, that is the case. Uh, Not as much anymore, but still recognizing the learning disability, especially when we're looking at younger students. So What led you on your path to Fraser Academy? Um, I had actually looked at uh, Orton Gillingham tutoring. We had looked at the Reading Foundation and we had looked at um, Kenneth Gordon, then Kenneth Gordon in Burnaby, not the Maplewood campus, and Fraser Academy. And um, we had decided we would do a little wait and see. But in October, I went into the school. So Lauren was in grade three. And in October, I went into the school and said, you know, how is Lauren doing? How is she keeping up? And the teacher laughed. And it was like she threw a glass of cold water in my face. It was actually the most helpful thing anyone could have done for me because it was like this huge reality check. She laughed and said, oh my gosh, Maureen, Lauren can't keep up and she won't be able to keep up until she learns to read. And she said, you know, I put her beside a girl who's very kind and, and, you know, is helping her, but she can't keep up. And then um, the, uh, that was a Tuesday or Monday, Monday or Tuesday. The next day I went into Fraser Academy and Lauren started on Friday because I thought, this is just crazy. What are we doing? my child can't keep up. She's totally lost. She's incredibly bright. And yet she feels absolutely behind and lost in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is on top of uh, my child was incredibly compliant when she was younger. She wanted to please the teacher. She wanted to do well, you know, um, and yet there were things that were said in that school that were really atrocious. You know, one day she got sent to the principal's office and I, she was crying at lunch. She came home at lunch. She was crying saying she's never going back to school. She didn't know what she had done wrong. She was completely humiliated by the experience. I mean, you take a child in grade two who wants to please the teacher who tries their best and does everything they can to hide the fact that they can't read And then this child gets sent to the principal's office for what they do not know. So I go down to the school, had the audacity to knock on the staff room door. That was a big no-no I learned. (laughs) 
<laughs> anyway, <laughs> the teacher did actually come out and speak to me um, uh, after they made sure I understood this was a huge imposition and I had no right to ask to speak to the teacher. Um, and they said uh, that Lauren had been sent to the office for being stubborn and rude and refusing to follow instructions. And the instructions had been given in written form and the teacher did not know she could not read. That is what happened. So I talked to the teacher a bit about this. I get Lauren back into the classroom and then in front of everybody, she gives my child a lecture about being stubborn and um, refusing to follow instructions. I could have ripped her face off. Mm-hmm. I could That's have. The mama bears come out. It is terrible what some teachers do. The unfortunate thing is it's still happening in today's classroom. Yes. And this is not a unique story. I Um, know it's not. It's really terrible. And And that's, that is why we need actually the action of proper reading instruction in teacher's training. mm -hmm. And we don't have that. You don't have to take a course. You can become an elementary school teacher without having to take a course in teaching reading. Mm -hmm. You can do it without a course in teaching writing skills. And then we wonder why half the kids can't read and write. Yeah. So your daughter and I both attended Fraser Academy at the same time. Yes. So we've been connected for decades now. (laughs) Um, through this, this common thread of dyslexia and your experiences over the years at Fraser Academy have led you to have that deeper understanding of the essentials of reading development. So in those first days at Fraser Academy, did you notice a difference in your child? I noticed a huge difference right away. First of all, the teachers at Fraser talk to a child based on their intellect and their intellectual capacity, not their reading rate. Oftentimes in a mainstream classroom, a teacher will make the assumption that because a child is slow to read or having difficulty learning to read, they will make the assumption that child has a low intellect. And those two things are completely different. They're discrete. Intellect is discrete from ability to read. And so... The number one difference when my child got to Fraser Academy is the teacher actually had expectations of her and wanted her to demonstrate her skills and talents and knowledge independent of her ability to read and write. And then, of course, they also do uh, reading and writing instruction uh, independently in a one-to-one setting with kids, as well as in the classroom at Fraser. So you get very targeted, sequential instruction uh, that is based on phonics you know it's it's that phonetic awareness that sound symbol relationship which is what really dyslexia is 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 a breakdown between that sound and symbol you know if you think about it in, in like a code it really is like a code and that's why you'll hear people talk about breaking the code of language because that symbol of the letter a a means a and um you know Oftentimes, people with dyslexia, they don't put that relationship together or they don't put it together at a pace that affords them fluency in reading. And um, those are the kinds of things that that Fraser would work on using the Orton-Gillingham method um, and many other as well. But that idea of structured literacy, that approach of structuring literacy and really sounding, building the connection between the sound and the symbol. That's really the difference for kids. Lauren has very, my daughter is very severely dyslexic. She went to Fraser Academy in grade three and didn't actually learn to read until grade seven. And yet The way they taught at Fraser did not impede her learning. So she got the curricular content and she learned it verbally or through art or through pictures. Um, You know, she learned it in very several different ways, which gave her the foundation to succeed later on. And if if a classroom is set up with 
reading and writing is the primary tool for learning, you can see pretty quickly how the dyslexic child will be left behind. And that's what happened to Lauren in grade three when I asked the teacher how she was keeping up. It was because that classroom relied on reading and writing to teach and learn. And if you're in a classroom that relies on that, the dyslexic is at a huge disadvantage. And so at Fraser, it was a much more multi-sensory approach. And of course, she could, she felt successful at school. She felt like there was nothing wrong with her, even though she couldn't read. <laughs> and I remember going to a, a, a parking garage where we had to pay to get the gate up and she wanted to, to do it. And she jumps out of the car and runs around and is trying to figure it out. But of course, she can't read the instructions. And um, it was such a, a cold reality of what does the future hold if my child doesn't learn to read. Mm-hmm. And, you know, another memory of mine that is so poignant um, was I took a bunch of grade 11 students with Lauren, her some of her friends, to the Dairy Queen. And I don't know if you remember how the Dairy Queen has their menu. It's all up here on a big board. One of the boys said they were all kids from Fraser Academy, all dyslexic. And one of the kids asked the woman behind the counter, what kind of blizzards does she have? And she said, oh, they're all up there. <laughs> and she pointed to the board. And I saw this poor kid's face just sink. Like he went pale. You saw the color drain Mm -hmm. from his face because he could not manage that sea of words up on the board. And I luckily could read the board. (laughs) So I, I just said, Oh, look, they have this and that and that, but you can't underestimate what that's like for that boy in grade 11 who has actually worked very hard at school and yet still can't manage that sea of words. That's the other reason why self-acceptance becomes so incredibly important for this community is we have to be able to accept ourselves and learn to laugh at some of the things we're not good at. One of the most freeing things that happened to me um, when you're a woman in leadership, certainly in my generation, um, you know, you often might be the only girl in the room. And one of the things that would inevitably happen is people would ask me to take the minutes because I was the only girl. And one of the most freeing things that happened when I got my psych ed was people would say, can you take the minutes? I'm like, nope. (laughs) Somebody else is going to have to do that because uh, because of course my minutes were always disastrous because I was a terrible note taker. (laughs) And if I was writing, I couldn't often hear what was being said because I can't, couldn't do those two tasks at the same time, but it was so freeing to be able to say, nope. And that's, you know, if I could pick one goal for all the dyslexic kids that I've ever met, it's for them to be able to take it, take it lightly that they're not good minute takers. It's like, no, I can't do it. Someone else is going to have to, you know, and not feel bad about it. Definitely. Right. And not feel ashamed of the fact that I'm not a good note taker. So, uh, yeah. Well, what point in your children's journey at Fraser Academy, did you decide that you need to take that more active role and make sure that this has a future? Because, you know, I don't know if people know this, but the school that you were at kind of had a life sentence. Yes. Um, um, so what, what happened at Fraser um, was that um, the school was quite expensive, but not performing according to the charges. So I would say you were paying a premium dollar for a mediocre mediocre product. That's how I would have described the school. And um, that really burned me because I thought if there were any kids at all in this world that deserve a premium product, it's these ones. They need that premium quality instruction. They need a school that believes in them. They need people at the school to believe they can become anything they want in the world. And at the time, we did not have leadership that behaved that way. So um, as you know, I had gotten my MBA. I was working as a fundraiser in the school and um, 
the board actually approached me about the job of head of school. And I, you know, it was never, ever an intent that I would run a school. But I had, because of my role in fundraising, I had, I knew all the board members. And I had common goals with them. Our kids were the same age. I knew what I thought needed to happen at the school. And um, it was not an easy road. <laughs> you know, I, I, my first staff meeting when I, it was announced that I was the incoming head, there were a lot of people who were just gobsmacked in the school because, of course, the teachers are like, what? She's not even a teacher. And um, some of them got right on board, but others had a real problem with it. And, um, you know, in my first staff meeting with the staff, I talked about uh, user pay education as a service industry. And that was gobsmacking for people. You know, the the notion that education would be a service. Mm -hmm. I go, of course, it's a service. Think about it. You're providing a service, just like in a restaurant, only the stakes are way higher. And, um, you know, I said, we are in the business of serving kids and families, and that's what we're going to do. We're putting them first from now on. And um, there were people in the school that had a hard time with that. But there were also a whole bunch of people who came on board with that. And um, uh, so we set to work over time. I, I was the head of the school for 14 years. And my goal, my original goal was, I just want to clean it up and hand it over to an educator, a quality educator. And it took longer than I thought. I was hoping to be out of there in five years. And I ended up staying for 14. And mostly because I felt like our work had not, we had not finished our work. So we really wanted to raise the bar in the quality of instruction. So we spent a lot of money on professional development. We wanted to um, change the notion of how kids think about themselves. So we increased increased the the counseling staff. Um, We wanted to um, really be science focused on our approach to reading. So all those things, you know, then we said about, okay, what can we do? We went to the International Dyslexia Association and we looked at all the schools in the States of which there are many fine, fine schools in the US and said, okay, who's doing what and what do we want to emulate? And, you know, we just methodically went about improving the school. We had to sell the staff on the idea of continuous improvement and, you know, that, um, by looking at where you've come from, where you're at, where you are today and where you're going, you can actually get a a great deal of satisfaction over time as you improve. And, um, you know, a couple of years in, one of the staff members said to me, I just feel so demoralized because we're not there yet. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) Look at, look at where we've come from and look where we are. We've done a lot. And yes, we have somewhere to go still, but we're always going to have somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't take stock of where we are today and reassess our goals, you know, the minute you stop moving forward, you're moving backwards. There's no such thing as inertia. There really isn't in, in terms of progress. You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. So we always want to be reassessing our goals, redefining them, tweaking them so that we still know we're on the right path and we're heading in the right direction. And we take satisfaction in what we've accomplished when we look behind us. And we've used that uh, notion of continuous improvement that you're never going to be there you're always going to be trying to improve along the way. Um, We've used that at the school really effectively. And that's an idea that I got from CASE, which is the Canadian Accredited Independent Schools Association. And um, Fraser Academy joined CASE. They joined the ISABC, which is the Independent Schools Association. And those are both organizations that are groups of schools that want to be better that they always want to be better. And to be affiliated with those two organizations is a tremendous asset for any school because of the sharing and the shared learning 
that goes on in those schools and everybody contributes and everybody collaborates and everybody works towards getting every school in the organization better. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge part of Fraser Academy growing and sort of growing up, if you will, to become the school that it is today and now becoming a center for dyslexia with all the outreach that the school is doing. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the school does um, after school tutoring, summer programs, uh, spring break programs for kids who cannot attend the full-time day school. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there are kids who are going to um, the after school programs and doing, using it to maintain their um, standing in their public school rather than actually making a wholesale school change. And it's been very, very effective. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely, unfortunately, something that we need. Uh, yes. But we need to move away from that need for that school and have it so that our public, public education programs fit the needs of our students. Uh, yes. That have. Money. Yes. And Fraser is partnering with uh, the VSB and training some of the VSB staff now, which is very exciting. And uh, of course, it's our hope that we can, you know, make Fraser obsolete. Yes, yes of course. <laughs> I don't think that'll ever happen because I think people love quality. And when you make some, build something of quality, people want it. Yeah. But having said that, the goal really is to make Fraser obsolete so that every school is doing its job and that every learner's needs can be met in whatever school they, they start in. Mm -hmm. And not having to leave their neighborhood to school to get the education that they have a, a right to. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Maureen. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I look forward to our upcoming conversation about teacher education and preparing teachers to understand the science of reading or structured literacy so they can have that success in the classroom. Yes, exactly. Me too. Thanks for uh, chatting. <laughs>